Good evening, everyone. Oh, I like that. Usually, we don't get call and response, but that's good. That, I like that. It works very well. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story. In 1917, Charles Beard, uh, a progressive social activist, and James Harvey Robinson, an historian and social activist, resigned from Columbia University in protest over the new policy forbidding all faculty to protest World War II, newly entered by the United States. John Dewey and Thorsten Veblund, preeminent philosophers of education in that period, and in this period as well, soon joined them with a single and singular purpose to create an institution, which they called the New School for Social Research, our original name. This new institution would be committed to promoting academic freedom and fostering a desire to participate in the democratic social reconstruction of society among American social scientists. That year was 1919. This year is the New School Centennial Year. I'm Bee Banyu, Chair of Food Studies here at the New School. I'm particularly pleased that this special program, the book launch of Timothy A. Wise, Eating Tomorrow, Agribusiness, Family Farmers, and the Battle for the Future of Food, is the first pro program in our centennial year that the Food Studies program is co-sponsoring. This evening's program is exactly the kind of discussion of critical social issues that our founders, if they were here, would be engaging us in. Let me pause a moment and tell you a little bit about the Food Studies program. We offer a bachelor's degree and applied science degree, focusing on three concentrations, food culture, media, and communication, health and nutrition, and policy and politics. We also offer some special programming, such as this event tonight. During this semester, we're planning three more events. On March 1st, Fogo Island Food Circle, Food Community and Economic Development from a Small Island to a Large Planet. Zita Cobb and the chef of Fogo Island Inn will speak with Mitchell Davis from the James Beard Foundation and food writer Gabriel Gersonson. On April 4th, we'll have a session of our Culinary Luminaries series. This one's about Madeline uh, Kamen, a chef, restaurateur, cooking school operator, cookbook writer, TV personality, and mentor to many, many chefs. One of those chefs, Ruth Gresser from DC, who runs Pizza Paradiso, which now has five different restaurants in the DC area, will join Kathy Kaufman, Andy Smith, and Bobby Pritzker in a discussion. On April 5th and 6th, we're going to be putting together, or we're in the process of putting together, a food writing forum. Opportunities and challenges in the digital age. It's a two-day conference being organized by food studies faculty members Andy Smith and Roseanne Gold. Confirmed speakers already are Ken Albala, Kate Cox, Dory Greenspan, Sarah Moulton, and Marian Nessel, and lots and lots more. The first two events are on Eventbrite now, and the conference will be up shortly. There are many, many, many more events being offered by other programs at the New School in this very special year. Check the university uh, events calendar and Eventbrite. And please, please, please come and help us celebrate 100 years. Um, now, I, I want to recognize and thank the other organizations that helped us make this event possible. Our partner, the publisher, of Tim Wise's book, or Timothy A. Wise's book, I get that right, the New Press, which is no relation to us, unfortunately. Uh, the New Press is not a, a not-for-profit publisher operating in the public interest. It publishes books that promote and enrich public discussion and understanding of the issues vital to our democracy and to a more equitable world. You can learn more about the New Press by visiting their website, www.newpress.com. And our co-sponsor, the Small Planet Institute, led by Diet for a Small Planet author Francis Morlappe, is a Cambridge-based think tank promoting living democracy and systematic solutions to hunger. Now, let's get down to business, and let me introduce our program participants. Mark Bittman, who is the author of 20 acclaimed books, including How, the How to Cook Everything series, he wrote for the New York Times for more than two decades and became the country's first food-focused op-ed columnist for a major news publication. Vandana Shiva is an Indian scholar 
environmental activist, food sovereignty advocate, and alter globalization author. Currently based in Delhi, she has authored more than 20 books, including Who Really Feeds the World? And then author of Eating Tomorrow, Agribusiness, Family Farmers, and the Battle for the Future of Food, Timothy A. Wise, who directs the Land and Food Rights Program at the Small Planet Institute and is a senior research fellow at Tufts University Global Development and Environmental Institute. Just want to let you know that we are taping this, so in the Q&A session, we'd like you to please, so we'd like to hear your questions on the tape, come up to this microphone and ask them. And also, after the program, each of these participants will be uh, uh, joining a table outside the auditorium to sign some books. Mr. Bittman. Hi. Um, <laughs> it really is call and response. Um, we're going to have a, Tim is going to speak, and then Vendana is going to speak for a little bit, and then we're going to have a group discussion. And um, I don't want to get too deep into anything right now, so I'm just going to speak um, for a minute. Uh, OK. In a way, the question that everybody asks all the time, which is, how do we, fe how do we feed the world, is a ridiculous question. Um, and it could be a done deal. That there are enough resources of all kinds to make humanity healthy, to guarantee that all of our human sisters and brothers around the world can thrive. We know that that isn't the way things have gone to date. But when I hear that question, and we hear it all the time, how are we going to feed the 10 billion? It makes my blood boil. The simple answer is eliminate poverty because there's already enough food, and that is the truth. What Tim so nicely demonstrates in Eating Tomorrow is that much of the food, that so little of that food is grown sensibly. Then again, so much is. The way that we raise food in the United States and in other hyper-developed countries as well as the way we impose our will on the rest of the world for the sake of profit, means that not everybody has the option to eat well. Of course, everybody who has money, no matter where they live, can eat just fine, and that trend is going to continue. One question we might ask is, what are basic human rights? In theory, the right to nutritious food is one of them. It's written down. In reality, the only basic human rights that the international community even tries to enforce are the right to not be killed or tortured, and as we know, even that rule is bent by more powerful countries. When the right to eat decent food is not about money, or that is when it's not entirely about money, it isn't as it is in the United States, it's often about the right to farm, which means it's about the right to land. Tim and Vandana have both traveled widely to see how people around the world solve land and sustainability problems when they're not interfered with by bigger powers, and even sometimes when they are. <clears throat> One little fact that's bound to come up tonight, and I think then I'll shut up, is, is this. We hear a lot about modern agriculture and the Green Revolution and the brilliant technology associated with it, and how we need to destroy the earth in order to feed the world. It's a lie. Seventy percent, and some would say 80, of the world's agricultural resources are used to feed 30 percent of the population. That's what industrial agriculture does for us. I guess I don't need to point out to a sophisticated audience like this one that much of what we eat isn't actually fit to eat, which leads me to a slight digression, uh, not shut up quite as quickly as I thought I would. Um, if we look at a dictionary, we can clear up some misunderstandings. One is that it helps to define food. Food is a substance that provides nutrition and promotes growth. The word nutrition is important here because it means that growth is promoted, in, that the growth that's promoted is healthy growth. Food is supposed to promote health and growth. Now, if we look up poison, we see that it's a substitute that promotes illness. So by definition, and without going into this too deeply, since this isn't my talk, 
Much of what's produced by industrial agriculture is quite literally not food, but poison. So rather than feeding the world, we might be talking about poisoning the world. And that's without getting into chemicals or industrial ag's contribution to climate change. One more definition. I'm repeatedly asked about the role of technology in the future of food production, we all are, as if saying there's an app for that or inventing some new kind of meat is actually the answer. But there's a definition of technology too. The definition of technology is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. What small farmers do is to apply scientific knowledge, knowledge for practical purposes and those purposes may not include spoiling the earth or poisoning their fellow humans, but they are technological. Maintaining soil health involves technology. Back to the original statistic. If 70% of all agricultural resources are used to feed 30% of the world's population, the corollary is that 30% of those resources feed 70% of humans. What's efficiency and what's high tech? Certainly not industrial agriculture, it's really high death. So on to Tim and to Vandana, who you actually came to see. Uh, the format is going to be 20 minute talk by Tim, um, a little bit of commentary by Vandana, and then a conversation among the three of us, and then finally um, questions by you, and I suppose answers by us. Thank you. No, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here, and thank you for that, that lovely introduction. You, you literally almost took some of the words right That's out of my mouth. So, <laughs> but I'll forgive you for that. Um, no, I really appreciate you joining, us, joining me for the event, and, and Vandana, too, um, uh, she, here from a long way away. Um, and. I can't tell you how many times I was reminded in the course of researching Eating Tomorrow over the last five years of Vandana's essay, Monocultures of the Mind, about the, narrow, the narrowness of Western scientific thinking and the elimination of alternatives. It came up repeatedly. Um, and of course, I have to thank Mark Favreau and my editor at the New Press and the New Press for publishing a book that is truly beautiful, I think. Don't you think so? <laughs> You'll get your chance. Um, um, and, um, and also making it more compelling by taking some of my words and putting them on the cutting room floor. You won't know what's not there, but you'll be happy that it's not there. Um, I, I also should say, I, I really have to thank the New Press for setting the publication date. This book was only formally published yesterday, which was my birthday. So. Best birthday present ever, an even better one for you when you buy it afterwards. Um, and, and really thanks to, to B. Banyu for and the Food Studies program here at, at New School for hosting us. Um, this also is kind of the biggest birthday party anyone's ever thrown for me as well. <laughs> Just you. Solo. Um, I think I think we're, we're one of the things that we're really pleased about about the book is the title, um, "Eating Tomorrow," and and it actually comes with a story that is um, that is entirely true, even though it doesn't sound it. A year, about three years ago, before when I was had my first book proposal, and before I was working with Frances Moore LePay at the Small Planet Institute um, in Cambridge, I asked her if she would give me advice on a book proposal. And she very graciously said yes. We met for lunch in Cambridge. Uh, she gave me very good advice, which um, uh, again really shaped the book. And the, it, it, what you will what you will read is um, it very much has her imprint. Um, but um, we brainstormed a title. I didn't have a working title that I liked, and we brainstormed titles. She's very good at titles, so that was. Um, but, but we still came out with nothing we liked. I, walk, I was walking home, my cell phone rings, I answer the phone, it's Frankie, and I say, hi Frankie, and she says, hey Tim, how about eating tomorrow? And I literally said, well, I really enjoyed our lunch, Frankie, and I guess we could 
do it tomorrow? And she said, no, 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 your title, your book, Eating Tomorrow, the title. True story, and that's how we ended up with Eating Tomorrow. I, I think what I particularly like about it, and I think resonates, is that it really captures the double meaning. The double meaning captures the real essence of what I was trying to communicate which is that humanity does indeed face a continuing challenge to ensure that everyone can eat today. And climate change poses, makes that challenge all the more daunting about making sure everyone can eat tomorrow. But the way we're producing our food is on chemical intensive industrial scale farms is quite literally devouring the natural resources, the seeds, the land, the soil, the climate, the water on which future food production depends. By continuing and now even expanding such unsustainable production methods, we are eating our collective tomorrows. And the powers that be, far from shifting away from that kind of a damaging farming model, are instead promoting ever more industrial scale agriculture, as Mark was saying. And that's all under the banner of feeding a, a hungry world, um, with rising populations, the same old neo-Malthusian mantra that we've heard for years. I wrote this book because with 30 years in this field, I wanted to understand why policymakers were ignoring all the low-cost solutions all around them, offered by small, their own small-scale farmers. And instead, they're pushing expensive policies that not only fail to help the hungry eat today, they are undermining the capacity of, of all of us to eat tomorrow. The subtitle of the book summarizes basically my, di uh, my diagnosis, Agribusiness, Family Farmers, and the Battle for the Future of Food. There is definitely a battle for the future of food. I saw it waged all over the world. Agribusiness firms have largely hijacked the policy agenda nearly everywhere I traveled. Um, and if we want to ensure that everyone enjoys the right to food, as Mark pointed out, that everyone can eat tomorrow, we need to place family farmers at the center of that discussion, helping them feed their families, their communities, their countries, while they nourish the planet. That's the central finding of this book. The question, how will we feed the world, I'm really glad Mark uh, went off on that. <laughs> I go off on it too. Um, it's, it's an important question. I mean, we have to recognize that there are challenges to uh, in, in a, a world of climate change that we all have to address. But it's, a, it's kind of a, a good question with a lot of bad answers. And those bad answers, more, more often than not, focus on the need to grow more food commodities everywhere in the world. We just need to grow more food. That was as, is as wrong today as it was when Francis Moore LePay first wrote it in Diet for a Small Planet, that hunger is not the product of scarcity of food. And it's, it's equally true today. Just last year, Reuters, within the course of one week, Reuters reported that the world is experiencing a global grain glut, that there's, there's grains piling up outside silos and rotting for lack of markets for them. And yet at the same time, the UN reports that we've seen a 5% uptick in the, in the incidence of chronic malnutrition, with another billion people, uh, 800 million, over 800 million, facing chronic malnutrition, and another one billion facing some form of malnutrition. So it's hunger amid plenty, just like we've seen the beat goes on. And why do we keep getting it so wrong, thinking that growing more food is going to solve that problem? It never has, and it never will. And that's because, as Mark said, the question, how will we feed the world, is just fundamentally flawed and deeply arrogant, in fact, because the presumption, of course, is that the advanced developed countries are the ones who are going to feed the world with our modern agriculture, our high yield production. But nothing could be further from the truth. 70% of the food consumed in developing countries where hunger is the worst is grown in those countries. They are the ones growing the food. As Vandana highlights in her, in her book, in, in, in the title of her book, Who Really Feeds the World? She's trying to go straight after that question, and it's an important one. But the other piece of this is that there's no, there's no abstract world out there waiting to be fed. It's not, they're not passively sitting, sitting around out there being hungry. There's about a billion people who are deeply hungry, and the majority of them 
are in agricultural communities and are in small-scale farming communities. And that is the obvious paradox, food producers some, suffering some of the worst hunger. Well, the obvious answer is to put food producers in a better position to grow more of their own food and sustain their communities and their families. And as I, but as I saw in country after country in the course of this research, policymakers are doing no such thing. Why are they doing no such thing? Well, my conclusion was that it would cut into agribusiness profits just about everywhere. How would it do that? Well, let me count the ways or at least share a few of the ways that you'll find in, in eating tomorrow. I mean, land grabbing is probably the most egregious and maybe the one that, um, that's grabbed the most headlines. In that, it's a term that refers to cash-strapped governments in poor countries giving away land to foreign investors in the hopes that those investors will provide a shortcut to modern farming, to high-yield agriculture. They rarely do. I followed in Mozambique in Southern Africa a uh, which is a particular target of land grabbing. I followed a, a Chinese rice company that was granted a long-term lease on 50,000 acres of irrigated land in a town called Shai Shai, about three, mile, three hours up the coast from the capital city of Maputo. The company no sooner got the lease than they plowed right through farmers' fields. This land was not unoccupied. They always say it's unoccupied. It never is. Plowed right through the fields. Angelico Moyane, one of the leaders in the community, told about how watching bulldozers plow up her ripe corn, corn plants. She and other farmers protested, which is one other thing you see everywhere, is resistance. Um, and they actually forced the company to withdraw from many of those lands that they'd taken. But now the project is failing on its own, on, on its own terms. It's just not a productive project like many of these are. I saw graveyards of land grabs all over the world. And that leaves the lands undeveloped again and off limits to the local producers. So what do the farmers want, I asked. You would be surprised how rarely anybody asks farmers, what do you want? I ask people all the time, well, what do you want? In this case, they said, uh, one leader told me, just give all the land back to the communities. Like, duh, this is what we want. And local farmers in Shai Shai are, are taking steps to actually make that happen. They formed a new association. They named Sakane, which in their local language means happy. Um, and they've petitioned for 750 acres of land that will let their members grow more food. The women of Shai Shai show us the way if we will listen. It's not clear who's listening, but the question is obvious. If you want to feed the hungry, why not give good land to food producers to grow more food? It's a good question for the government of Zambia, where I, which I studied quite a bit. 78% of Zambians, uh, of rural residents, are in extreme poverty, and the government has carved out 250,000 acre farm blocks for foreign investors. Wilfred Monga is, has 12 acres of land and some cattle in southern province in, in Zambia. He's a relatively prosperous farmer by Zambian standards. And his kids didn't look, uh, didn't, his family didn't seem poor. But he told me he worries that his children, particularly his girls, um, won't have enough land to support the family because land gets divided within families. Imagine though, in this land rich country, one 250,000 acre farm block could provide 25,000 land poor farmers with 10 acres each. 10 acres would be plenty, plenty to support a family, plenty to grow a surplus and sell a surplus and have some cash income to invest in, your, in their farms, plenty to send their kids to school. And that's what agricultural development looks like. It always has and it will continue to look like that. And with that kind of bottom-up progress, you're actually addressing the so-called population problem because with progress, economic progress, comes reduced population growth, particularly if you focus on empowering girls and educating girls. So far, that's not what the Zambian government is doing. Large firms and local elites are reaping the profits. Another agribusiness-friendly 
policy that I saw in much of Southern Africa was the so-called Green Revolution for Africa, which Mark also mentioned. This is a well-funded attempt to increase farm production by pushing commercial seeds and synthetic fertilizers. Governments put scarce public funds, in some cases as much as 60% of their entire agricultural budgets, in subsidies so small farmers can purchase from the private sector seeds and fertilizers. I start the book, in fact, um, in Malawi with the so-called Malawi miracle. It's called the Malawi miracle because the government got fed up with being told they couldn't subsidize anything by the World Bank and the IMF, and they decided to do these subsidies. And they actually worked for a while. Um, they saw increases in corn production um, that were quite significant for a few years. But it only worked for a short while. Synthetic fertilizers did nothing for the long-term fertility of the soil, which is planted year after year after year in corn, partly because that's what the government is subsidizing. They're giving you subsidies for seeds to grow corn. So you get monoculture corn drenched in fertilizer. Pouring fertilizer onto monocrop corn is like putting trout in a pond every spring. You can get some, you can, you can pull some trout from that pond in the summer. And sure, people can, farmers can pull some corn from their land. But the land is no more capable of sustaining life than it was before the season started. It actually grows more acidic, less capable of producing food. Yields plateau. It then takes farmers more and more fertilizer just to get the same level of production. And most farmers can't afford the fertilizer. Today, Malawi shows scarcely any evidence of a reduction in rural hunger. Meanwhile, though, and again, farmers show the way, enterprising farm groups there are showing, uh, are, have improved a local variety of corn that, that, was, that, they, that they've been growing for years and years and years. Careful seed selection made it more productive. It's high in vitamin A, which is very much in, in demand in, uh, and very much needed in the diets uh, of people in the area. But they don't have to buy those seeds every year from Monsanto or another seed company, and they don't have to buy fertilizer to drench it. Um, each year to make it grow. They interplant a variety of crops mixed together. That improves soils. It diversifies their families' diets, right? Diet families aren't just pulling corn out of the ground every year and eating only corn. They're eating a variety of, of vegetables and other nutritious crops. And it also helps them withstand climate shocks because if a drought kills their corn or a pest kills their corn, other crops are there to survive and feed the family. I heard farmer after farmer sing the praises of this agroecological agri farming that they're doing, and they're now beginning to sell that vitamin A rich corn to neighboring farms and to aid agencies. But what does the government do? It drafts a seed policy that strengthens the rights of commercial plant breeders and threatens the rights of these same farmers to save, exchange, and sell their own seeds. Why? Because the policy says only certified seeds can be sold. They in fact say, and this shocked me, that these seeds, which farmers have been using for generations, can't even be called seeds. They can only be called grain, worthy of eating but not planting. How, how can such nutritious corn, which we have planted for generations, not be a seed, one farmer said to me. I was actually arguing with one of the defenders of the policy in Malawi, and exasperated, I said, the way this policy reads, it could have been written by Monsanto. And after a long pause, he looked at me and said very sheepishly, um, well, one former Monsanto official was a co-author of the policy. I was shocked. I wrote about it, my report um, of Monsanto's bald-faced conflict of interest in this, um, in this issue um, prompted an outcry and some reforms to the seed policy, I'm glad to say. But the, the scary thing is that the companies and their philanthropic allies, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, have their sights set on, quote unquote, opening Africa to the seed giants for commercial seeds, including GMOs. And that's been dubbed in places like Malawi, the new colonialism. 
it is very much a colonial undertaking. They have certainly succeeded in capturing most African governments with their funds, with their campaigns, and with their pressure. In, in the capital city of Lilongwe in Malawi, I saw farmer Evelyn Jolomole from this community that was growing the, the orange maize um, displaying it um, and some of the products they make from it in, a, in a, an exhibition on, on, on an adaptation to climate change. And the, the president of Malawi actually, Peter Mutarika, actually came to her booth. She had this farmer from Lobi uh, in central Malawi had the opportunity to speak with the president. And when he, she handed him a bag of this beautiful bright orange maize flower, he said to her, oh, is this from Monsanto? I thought immediately of the monoculture of the mind that Vandana has written about so eloquently. It's such a narrowing of our thinking to the, the stifling of our imaginations. Evelyn was actually on TV that night explaining that no, to the president, that no, this was actually a freely available natural resource that could solve Malawi's food security problems. I actually had a lot of interactions with Monsanto that you'll read about in the book. Um, my most intense was in Mexico, uh, where the company has been trying to get permission to grow genetically modified corn there, despite the very real dangers of cross-pollination with Mexico's rich heritage of native maize varieties. Local farmers there called it genetic pollution, of course, and they actually want an injunction um, to stop the seed companies from planting GMOs in Mexico, um, an injunction that has held for five years. Um, I was surprised that I got an interview with Monsanto in the course of this. Um, it turned into a five-hour meeting with six company executives that can, I can only describe as surreal. Um, I can't it's described in detail in the book. I'll just give you a snippet. They started out by saying that, that Mexico would starve without Monsanto's seeds, GMO seeds, which is obviously wasn't true. They just had their biggest yield increases in decades without them. Um, and the yields on GMO crops aren't any better anyway, so just pure propaganda. But they went on to tell me that, GM, that, that they wanted to introduce GM corn to help Mexico achieve food sovereignty. This was the term they used, food sovereignty, coming out of Monsanto's mouth. I don't know if you all know food, the word food sovereignty or the term, but it's the rallying cry from peasant farmers around the world to protect themselves from companies like Monsanto. Food sovereignty is all about maintaining local and national control. Later, when I told farm leader Victor Suarez about my conversation, he was just outraged. He told me, our problems are complex. GMOs are simple. Our problems will not be solved by a single gene. I couldn't agree more, and I am really glad to report one of the many reasons I can find hope in the course of this story is that Victor Suarez is now Subsecretary of Agriculture for Food Self-Sufficiency in the new government of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, which took office in December last year. And Lopez Obrador has announced his intention to ban the cultivation of GM crops in Mexico. Not surprisingly, though, agribusiness influence is, is the strongest in the United States. Um, and I found that in Iowa. I wrote about Iowa uh, in a section that starts, that's titled The Roots of Our Problems. Um, Iowa is blanketed in corn and soybeans, dotted with factory hog farms and ethanol refineries, and struggling to keep its water clean from all of the runoff of the chemicals. And there I met Matt Liebman, a brilliant Iowa State scientist who has shown, been trying to nibble at the edges, how do we make this, this behemoth of an agriculture more sustainable? How do we make it less damaging? And he's shown that the simple incorporation of a rotation, an added rotation of grasses into the normal corn and then soy and then corn and then, corn and then soy rotation of crops 
would have enormous benefits. It would reduce fertilizer use by 85%. It would eliminate water pollution from runoff. It would reduce soil erosion and improve soil fertility. And it would all in that, do that all by maintaining the profitability and the productivity of the farm. I said, what more could you want? That's the win-win-win solution everyone's looking for, right? I asked him how many farmers were using his system. Almost none, he told me. I could not have devised a program that affected more of the state's agribusinesses. Think about this. 85% fertilizer reduction, reduce fertilizer sales for the companies. Growing, growing less corn and soybeans because you added a, this new crop rotation. Fewer seed sales for, and herbicide sales for Monsanto. Possible small increases in corn and soy prices, the basis of feed for livestock firms. Higher costs for Smithfield, Tyson, and other factory farms. Higher corn costs for ADM for its ethanol refineries. Agribusiness basically put a veto on these policies. So the obstacles to these, reform, these kinds of reforms are indeed daunting, and I saw that everywhere. But I also saw a lot of reason for hope. And, and actually, I'll close just by, uh, because I think every book reading should have a reading, right? Um, <laughs> by reading, uh, promising that it's not actually a spoiler. You don't need a spoiler alert for this, because I think you know how it ends. Um, uh, reading the conclusion to the book. The good news is that in the battle for the future of food, farmer resistance is strong and so are farmers' alternatives, many advanced under the banner of food sovereignty. In Malawi, farmers and their allies resist the imposition of a seed policy drafted by Monsanto and they pursue an independent path using their own improved seeds in soils, growing more fertile with their agroecological practices. In Mozambique, farming communities defend their hard-won land rights from land grabs while promoting climate-resilient farms. Zambians fight for a just national land policy that recognizes women's rights. Excuse me. Women's rights to secure village land and demands limits on corrupt land deals that give the best lands to foreigners and the rich. In India, the Right to Food movement defends its National Food Security Act against hypocritical trade complaints from the United States, pushing for grassroots rural development in the world's hungriest country. In Mexico, farmers and their allies sustain a multi-year resistance to the forced adoption of genetically modified maize, promote a transition to agroecology, and elect a president who might just reverse the trade and agricultural policies that have undermined small-scale farmers. And even in Iowa, residents demand clean water for more sustainable farming practices, livable communities not polluted by factory farms, and checks on the control agribusiness exerts over government policies in the state. All are striving for the same thing, the right of everyone to eat safe and healthy food today, while ensuring that we steward our natural wealth so we can all eat tomorrow. Thank you. Great talk, Tim. Very inspiring. Thank you. Um, I spent a little time with Matt Liebman, um, who's the guy in Iowa that Tim was just talking about. Um, and he painted, I went out to dinner with him one night, and um, he painted a picture of Iowa for me. And Iowa, for those of you who have not been, but you've obviously all seen pictures, is ground zero for industrial agriculture. And in a way, for most of us, it's inconceivable to imagine it looking other than the way it does. And the way it looks is mile after mile after mile after mile after mile forever of corn and soybeans, occasionally broken up by a town. Matt sat there and painted a picture for me of what Iowa might look like and what it could look like. And it was, I became emotional. I mean, it was just phenomenal. And it was like hearing a discussion of it was he like hearing a believable discussion of heaven. So I, um, it's possible, which brings me to a question for you, which I had to write down because you know, I have like a attention span of a gnat. So um, I keep saying that the United States is going to be the last country in the world to get on board with 
let's say, regenerative agriculture with fair and just food supplies. And yet, of course, there are people in this country who are on the right side of the struggle and people who care. So, um, and yet again, we, I, I'll include myself, are often filled or at least tinged with despair. So a three-part question. How do we learn how to dream? How do we teach others how to dream? And how do we support the struggles of people in the rest of the world who know how to dream? But you can talk about whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think we learn how to dream by seeing the reality that works for the earth, has worked for 10,000 years in good farming, indefinitely in my country, that's the history. On this land, we normally forget the First Nations have an agriculture history, that it doesn't begin with the ruination of the land. How do we help others to dream? You know, I, I'm basically trained in quantum theory. I started to look at agriculture because in 1984, the city of Bhopal, which you mentioned, in your last chapter on the right to food at the end of your train journey, had the leak of a pesticide plant. And you might remember thousands died. That pesticide plant in those days was owned by Union Carbide, which was since then bought by Dow, which has now merged with DuPont, just as Monsanto has merged with Bayer, and Syngenta, which was already a mega, mega merger of Seba and Sandoz and Astra and Zeneca, has merged with ChemChina. So you have a cartel of three. And uh, not only did we have that disaster, that same summer, we had the explosion of violence in the state of Punjab, which was the lab of the Green Revolution, which now Mr. Bill Gates is trying to spread with violence across Africa. And when you were talking about the seed laws of Malawi, was thinking of the fact that this man called a meeting in London. And because he gives a little bit of philanthropy like a bait, he called all the governments and said, you're going to harmonize your seed laws. And they're going to be laws that make it illegal for farmers to have their own seed. And they're going to force commercialization. Now Africa, I mean India had a longer history of commercialization, but Africa doesn't. So literally from farmers breeding straight into Monsanto's anti-breeding. Like you said, this is not food. What they're breeding is not seed. I call this anti-food, I call what they produce anti-seed. Because seed is supposed to give rise to seed. We call it bija, that which arises from itself again and again and again. A seed that's been terminated, a seed that's been genetically modified, can't be saved, and the ontology of trying to separate the seed from the grain when grain is the seed. And fertile grain is fertile seed. You know, they tried to do the terminator. And I know uh, in this country, there are two things you've gone crazy, three things you've gone crazy about in your diet. Turmeric. <laughs> and it's interesting, when I was doing my PhD in Canada and I was looking for an apartment, I was rejected again and again on grounds that, oh, you come from the country where they cook with the yellow thing. Well, the yellow thing is all over this country now. And of course, kale. Yeah? You're, you're, huh? <laughs> you're responsible for... Um... So, we've eaten diversity forever, and that's why when I saw a forest become monocultures of eucalyptus and Punjab become a monoculture of rice and wheat, and I did a book then for the United Nations called The Violence of the Green Revolution to try and understand how did we arrive in this crisis. Um, that's what then led me to start looking at the WTO, which you've mentioned in your last chapter. Interestingly, I was called for a meeting in 87 where the biotech industry, it wasn't a biotech industry, it was a chemical industry, and they had their roots in the concentration camps making chemicals for explosives. That's the origins of the nit nitrogen fertilizers. Um, and in a way, when I'm looking back and you were introducing the 
the new school. I'm thinking of here's a century of the struggle for freedom of knowledge, freedom of thought, freedom of people, going parallel with the century of ecocide and genocide. I have come to the conclusion that that's what the past century has been, of experimenting with chemicals that were designed to kill people, then being introduced into agriculture as agrochemicals. And then the same companies said, oh, we can use the tools of recombinant DNA to pretend we've invented the seed and take Pattinson's seed. That's what they were talking about at that meeting in 87 that led me to start saving seeds and led me to start Navdanya. Now, there were three agreements imposed on the w, through the GATT th and into the WTO. You've mentioned a lot about the current use by the United States of the US to prevent India from procuring from its farmers for the biggest public distribution system in the world. Our right to food is based on our public distribution system. It's the only country with a law that's enshrined the right to food. And the U agribusiness basically taken us to a WTO dispute um, panel to say it's all right to subsidize the distribution of food, but they should not buy from their farmers. So the three agreements that have devastated agriculture in the last 20 years has been the agreement on agriculture, and as I've written in many of my reports uh, and books, it was written literally by Cargill. The Cargill vice president was deputed to be the representative of the United States to write the agreement on agriculture, basically removing domestic support and removing all import restrictions, including quality. So Monsanto wrote the intellectual property. Writing Malawi's seed policy yeah. is But it nothing wrote the new. TRIPS agreement. They said we were the patient and the diagnostician and physician all in one. As a patient, they were saying, it's not fair that farmers save seeds. We must have an international law to prevent farmers from saving seeds. And as they wrote, we drafted a law, we took it to our government, and then had it imposed on the rest of the world. So I think part of US democracy, including food democracy, has to be to prevent the US State Department from being an arm of destructive agribusiness. And I think we need to organize to prevent this fake philanthropist to do all the work that Monsanto can't do directly by its pretend giving, because it's carving out the future empires. I have a new book that's out in India, and I hope it'll be out in the US, called Oneness Versus the 1%, which is the details of the destruction post WTO, the current destruction. Monsanto is now, has bought up the world's biggest climate data corporation. It's bought up the world's biggest soil data corporation. They are planning about three to four trillion in terms of insurance and trapping farmers in Ted. But at the same time, in total inconsistency, they're saying we're going to have farming without farmers. So who'll pay them the debt? They're talking about driverless tractors and spraying glyphosate from drones. And they've made the situation so desperate in Iowa that that looks like it's the only way. Interestingly, uh, all of their technologies, they call it digital agriculture, farming with robots, and farming with artificial intelligence, it's all failing. Because there's such tremendous intelligence in the biodiversity of the world, the soil organisms of the world, our gut, which is called the second brain. I mean, the world is bursting with intelligence of diverse kinds. Pathetic machine learning of the wrong things to reduce fertilizer use by 2%. Now, while you've written Eating Tomorrow, this gang of those who've destroyed our farming, our food system, spread chemicals, spread monocultures, robbed people of food, because it's in the design of this system to create hunger on the one hand, and malnutrition and chronic diseases on the other. It's all part of one piece. So in Who Really Feeds the World, I worked out that 75% planetary destruction has already taken place by the system that's given us only 30% food. If it goes to 45%, we're going to have a very dead planet. 
Same system, as you said, is giving us poison food, responsible for 75%. And yesterday, at my talk, Deepak Chopra was saying 90% of the chronic diseases are related to bad food. 90%. An interesting thing is, now that Bayer has bought up Monsanto, the glyphosate gives us cancer, and then Bayer sells the cancer drug. So it's, for them, a win-win-win situation. I remember, in, I think it was 84, there was a famine in Ethiopia. I was working then for the United Nations University. And I'm traveling to Ethiopia to do a study on the famine. And there's a person next to me, and he says, where are you going? I said, to, to study the famine. I said, who are you, and what are you doing? I'm Pioneer Hybrid. I'm going to sell hybrid seeds. But I said, they have a drought. Hybrid needs water more water. He said, that's precisely it. The more it fails, the more we sell. And that's the logic, that the more it fails, the more we sell. The more disease we spread, the more medicines we sell. And I call this the poison cartel, because that's how they are. They work like a cartel. You know, the Sicily mafia looks like child's play compared to what is being done to our food by this organized cartel. So the good news is that they're reacting <coughs> to things like eating tomorrow. The cartel has got together. They call themselves fresh. <laughs> they don't say poison. We have to say the poison. They say fresh. It includes the giants who were part of IG Farben, BASF, Bayer, which is now Monsanto, Cargill, DuPont, Nestle, Pepsi, Syngenta, and Yara. Yara is the world's biggest synthetic chemical fertilizer company. And this is what they write in this new report, which they've supported from a group called the Eat Forum that was meeting yesterday in the United Nations. They brought a film actor <laughs> to promote the report. The report is called the EAT Report on, uh, I think it's on the future of the planet and our diet. Now we know that 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from industrial agriculture and a majority of it is from nitrous oxide from synthetic fertilizers, which is 300 times more deadly in damaging the climate than carbon dioxide. Now here's how Yara will, and this EAT report will protect the climate. They're saying we need to spread more synthetic fertilizers in the third world. They don't have enough of it. It's like Larry Summers saying in 92, we don't have enough pollution. It's unfair that we don't have enough pollution. Now they're saying it's unfair we don't have enough pesticides and fertilizers. And then they talk about increasing yields. And this, I think, is the heart of the issue. The monoculture of the mind goes with measuring one output of one commodity, the yield, that which leaves the farm as a nutritionally empty commodity full of toxics. But the farm is a living agroecosystem, and it produces many things. All our research in Navdanya is showing that biodiverse farms produce much more nutrition per acre. We could feed two times the world's pop population with good food, by conserving our resources. We also build back the soils and reverse desertification. We reverse drought. 0.5% organic matter is holding 80,000 liters in a hectare of land. We're reversing poverty because when farmers have diversity and not that one monoculture corn or soya, for which they got into debt for the seed in the first place and the chemicals, and then when they bring it to the market, it has no value. And I've debated with Monsanto once long ago, where they said, by the time we are finished, corn will have no value. The corn that farmer grows will have no value. The genes we put into it will. Now, this cartel, the agree third agreement they brought into place is called the Sanitary and Phytosanitary Agreement, which basically is destroying, just like trips and intellectual property is making local good seed illegal. This is making local good food illegal. It's called the modernization of food safety. Shut down the small. Let the large and toxic flourish. Every day in India, we have to do a satyagraha on the seed issue. 
Every day we have to do a satyagraha on the food issue. We will not cooperate. Satyagraha was Gandhi's word. Now, our farmers who are saving seeds and creating their own local markets, practicing non-cooperation, are earning 10 times more by just getting good food to their neighbors rather than waiting for the cartel to buy the commodity from them. And finally, we worked with six states of India, which are moving to organic. Sikkim, with whom I work very closely, it's a Himalayan state, is 100% organic. It's the first region of the world. Bhutan as a country is trying to move there, but Sikkim is already 100% organic. And, you know, sometimes we think the power of these cartels is too big. But one case of a glyphosate cancer that was proven in the courts of California, of Johnson, led to the collapse of buyer's share by 35%. That's how much of a bubble they are. So they're going to destroy themselves anyway. But we need to grow real food and good food. And food is the web of life. It's solving the climate problem. It's solving every problem we face. And I believe it is solving the biggest problem of making people disposable. Zuckerberg at Harvard said, with artificial intelligence, 99% humanity will be useless. 99%. And then he's saying, we'll give them a basic minimum income to buy smartphones, to play games, to stay distracted for life. No. You're talking about the new Green Deal. They're not yet talking about rejuvenating and regenerating the land. That's the missing debate. They're still talking jobs. I think we need all hands to go to healing the earth and in the process, building community and providing everyone good, with good food. And that's as relevant in this country which has been devastated as much as in our countries, which is, are being devastated too. I, I have often think they've made our work easier. A poison cartel of three means yes, just three versus 300 million species and seven billion of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, can we talk a little bit about climate change and... Right. Sorry. Can we talk a little bit about climate change and how um, you've seen its impact on small farmers around the world and how big agriculture impacts climate change? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a... I, I actually lead the book that way because I, it was striking um, to travel through Southern Africa and see the impacts of, of climate change in ways you can't, that I couldn't have imagined, actually. Um, a community called in Maracuene, just, uh, just outside Maputo, um, on the coast, um, amazing cooperative of, or alliance of, of 19 cooperatives pulling together 7,000 women, mostly women farmers, with some irrigation and complete agroecological practices. And, and, they told me both the just how just the climate disaster that they've been living but also they showed how they were surviving it which was their agroecological practices they imagine they saw two consecutive years of drought they saw temperatures which it's hot in in that part of mozambique but but it's not 100 degrees hot every every growing season and it hit 100 the next year it hit 104 the next year it hit 110 110 degrees, and they said they, they just watched their plants shrivel in the, in the ground. They lost their maize crop. They lost their corn crop, which is the main staple, but they grow a variety of crops, so they didn't lose every crop. I, asked, I heard these stories, and I said, how did you survive? And they said, oh, well, if we have two more years like that, we'll be in bad shape, but we're okay. They're okay partly because they had their own seed bank. They had their own variety of maize that they preferred, a yellow variety that's nutrient rich. They had their own seed bank. So when the crop failed, farmers didn't lose their seeds. They went to the cooperative seed bank, got seeds, replanted a whole set of, seed, a whole set of 
corn, or, uh, fields of corn to grow out seeds for the whole community, and they had seeds in the next round. But climate change was so devastating that they got that the other, the, I, I call it the the evil twin of of drought is is extreme weather and floods. You get these torrential rains that they that they aren't used to that they haven't seen before, and the land isn't used to it. And they got this huge this deluge that flooded lands, washed away crops. Then the drought comes, and the drought was so bad that um, that their irrigation ditches, which are fed by the Incomati River, um, dried up. They're only four miles from the Indian Ocean downstream. Sea levels are rising. The salt water flowed back up their irrigation channels and into their irrigation ditches, poisoning the land with salt water. I could not imagine the, the range of devastation that they'd been seeing or uh, the climate attacking them in ways for three, four, five consecutive years. And yet their farm survived, they survived, and that was because th they have not a drought tolerant seed like Monsanto is trying to market, they have drought tolerant farms. They have climate resilient farms and they, they resist the floods. They hold the water in the soil when there's water scarce. They, they hold the soil down when the, when the deluges come. They, um, they provide farmers with nutritious crops that because they're intercropped with a variety of different, um, different food crops going at once, the family eats a more, a more diverse diet, but the land regenerates. The roots are deep in that land and it holds the land in place. So you get an enormous benefit from this kind of farming, but it is a devastating. Climate change is not a future phenomenon for these farmers. And instead of promoting those kind of policies, um, the governments are, promote, are trying to outlaw the use of those seeds and are promoting, again, seed and fertilizer subsidies that tell them just grow corn and just dump fertilizer on it. That's all you need to do. Um, I'm going to ask one. I, I could ask questions for the rest of the night, but um, those of you in the audience who want to ask questions should approach the microphone because I'm going to only ask um, one more. Um, and that is, I have a little bit of experience now with academia, just a little, less than you, less than you. But what's clear is that. Um, for 150 years at least, the, the money that's gone into research about agriculture has gone into the wrong kind of research about agriculture. So we've all used the statistic that says the majority of the world's food comes from the majority of the world's people and uses the minority of the world's resources, and the converse is true also. How can we encourage and how can we see more research going into making sustainable farming even better and demonstrating even more than it is being demonstrated that it is the way of the future and agroecology is the way we should be farming as opposed to industrial ag. I mean, is that a fair question? Well, it's, it's an enormous question. <laughs> and it, but, it's a, but it's a crucial question. I mean, I think, I don't know. I think my subtitle cuts to the chase agribusiness, family farmers, and the battle for the future of food. And it's the power of agribusiness that is hijacking that agenda, just like Matt Liebman told me about his farm and what was and wasn't adopted by farmers in Iowa. They, they control the purse strings on research, um, and they control the purse strings on donations. They gave $133 million in 2015 in, for, in lobbying to, um, in Washington, it, to US Congress members. 133 million, that was more that year than the defense industry. This is a huge and well-organized lobby, and it's because the policies are designed very much to put money in their pockets, to put their products into new markets like in Africa, and to, um, and to defend that model of agriculture. So I guess my, uh, I'll, I'll hearken back to my uh, colleague, Frank, Frank, Francis Moore LePay at Small Planet Institute, who is now focused on getting money out of politics, because ultimately we have to reclaim our democracy. And that's at the state level where 
boy, the Farm Bureau and the uh, and and big agriculture dictates what that what that state government will do. Um, but at the national level, it's true as well. And they control. And that, those same forces are the ones that are as active in, if not more, in the international sphere, trying to push international policies that, that again, like I said in my, my introduction, that fail to take advantage of the low cost, sustainable policies and practices that farmers are doing all around us. Did you want to add anything? Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the way I've had to deal with both the Green Revolution impact as well as the globalization and now the collapse of the globalization model is I created a learning center and participatory research. Because yes, we've got to do what we can with systems that are governed by the state. But I think at the moment now is we've got to evolve larger spaces of deep democracy and participatory democracy, and the food crisis will not be resolved without food democracy. And food democracy, in my view, includes democracy of knowledge, so we talk of the five freedoms. The seed freedom, the food freedom, the land freedom, the water freedom, and, incre and, and of course the climate issue linked to knowledge. We're talking about knowledge freedom, and I think that's why it's quite appropriate that this dialogue take place here in the new school, because I think our minds are the next step of colonization in a very, very severe and accelerated way. So keeping our minds free, then with few resources, you can do a lot. And you know, I mean, where do we have resources? We have very little in Navdanya. I know one of the people who's standing in queue for the next question, Devish, used to be in Goldman Sachs as a director. And now, He's so aware of what they were doing in, on terms of food speculation. I think it's just small people, many, many, many small people speaking the truth and doing the truth and growing good food and sharing good food and creating alternatives while we do our work in defending our representative democracies in their authenticity. Anyone? I'll, I'll, thank you very much for your presentation. And I had a question about the Iowa situation that you were describing. It wasn't exactly clear to me what was not being communicated to the farmers, because I've met a lot of farmers in Indiana and Iowa, and they're very sharp. They're on top of all the research that comes out. And if there's something that says that you can reduce your fertilizer usage by 85%, increase your profits, reduce the water runoff. They're going to listen to it. It's not a state-owned farm. It's a private farm. So what is not being translated from um, research to practice? No, that, that's a very good question, because I also found that farmers were very, very smart and quite knowledgeable about what was available to them. I think what Matt was referring to when he said that um, what he meant when he said that his research offended all of the major agribusiness interests in the state, that research is disseminated through state institutions and through, uh, through the government, and not just in academic journals. So his, he said his study appeared in an academic journal and was appeared as a U.S. Department of Agriculture publication. But what it would have taken is a, a reorganization of agriculture to incorporate a third crop. A very simple thing to do, but not something that's easy to do by one farmer. Because you have to have a market for that alfalfa. And so you, in a, in a sane, agricultural system, you develop markets for alfalfa because it's beneficial to the land, to the soil, to the, uh, to the climate, to the water, and to the farm. But any individual farmer is taking a huge risk trying to do that by themselves. And so it actually takes policy and organization. 
and that's something that um, this leave it all to the free market approach um, basically doesn't allow. And it and when you leave it all to the free market, you're leaving it all to the big corporations to determine what is and isn't going to be acceptable. I mean, there has to be infrastructure and for a single person to go against the trend, to buck the trend, then the extension agents are basically supporting the corporate model is really, really tough. I, want to, I, I just want to say, I like to say this. There's a, if, I, if we were to decide what a food system ought to be, we might say this is a system that should provide nutritious food for as many people as possible while respecting the earth. Something like that. Pretty simple. And yet what we have is a food system that's basically organized to maximize profit for a few hundred individuals who are running around amok. That's, to buck that trend is the work of our lifetimes, I think. And, and it's, a, it's a simple thing to say. It's sadly not a simple thing to do. I think it's most difficult in the Midwest because the, it's been emptied out. First of all, it was prairies. So it should never have been farmed. And uh, now, you know, I, in who really feeds the world, the statistics I have is, I think about 70% farms are owned by financial institutions, where the farmer is merely a tractor driver and is paying about 50% of the costs of production as lease. And 92, when the GMO soya came, I remember I asked a farmer of Iowa, I said, why are you growing this stuff? And he said, we have no choice. The companies have a noose around our neck. Now, it's that coercive power of leaving no option to the individual farmer because the entire infrastructure. You know, it looks like there are 36 companies out there. Each of them is owned by Cargill, whether it be the elevator or the train system, distribution. I mean, this grain giants control everything. And the seed, Monsanto controls the soya and the corn seed. And every year, I did a rough calculation in terms of how much is the royalty payment and, and uh, technology fees. 10 billion is what farmers of this country are giving to Monsanto as a free rent. And therefore, they're that much poorer. And that's where the lock-in is. And that's why, for me, this is about freedom. Of course, it's about food, but it's about freedom. Hi, thank you very much for this talk. It was fantastic and much appreciated. I had been wondering why it was that Bayer was willing to spring $62 billion to own Monsanto. And I was trying to figure out why that was. And then it turns out, especially with almost a trillion dollars in lawsuits against Monsanto, right now that could be judged against them. So as, what is in it for them? Why did it, does Bayer, I only know it is an aspirin company, right? Why could they possibly, it's a big headache, but yeah. So what, and then I was reading some stuff and I wanted to get your comments on it, that Monsanto has now succeeded, it sounds like, in genetically modifying marijuana. And so there's a whole push now, the legalization of marijuana is happening all over the U.S. Now, all of a sudden, at the same time that Monsanto, now owned by Bayer, has legalized marijuana and is going to be doing the equivalent of Roundup Ready marijuana. And it's going to be mass sprayed with all sorts of pesticides, the same way as corn and the same way as everything else. I was wondering, and so there's a lot of money in that for them. And, I don't know if it's going to amount to the trillion dollars in lawsuits, but I think they made a, a balance in what they're going to, you know, what they're willing to risk. And I was wondering what you thought of that and other ways of why they were willing to risk that amount of money. Thank you. I mean, uh, I'll, do, I'll try to give just a very short answer because I don't have a lot. I don't have a lot of information about that, but I also want to make sure that other people get a chance to ask questions. I mean, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. Is that you see a new market, you go into it. And if you have market power, you have the power to go into it. And you go into it with a technology that restricts access by others. 
So you create barriers to entry that make your patented product the product and the one that can give those royalties. And that's their advantage in a, in a new market like that. The question that you asked was precisely the question in my mind. And then we did the analysis, and that's what the new book that will come out sooner or later in, uh, in this country, Oneness versus the 1%. When you had the Wall Street collapse of 2008, and anyway, the financial system was getting deregulated, and the billionaires were growing with more and more with rent collection, they are the robber barons of today. They call themselves technology firms, but they are the robber barons. It could be Bezos, or it could be Zuckerberg, and all of this new money went into investment funds. And the two big ones are BlackRock and Vanguard. So if you look at the ownership of the buyers and the Monsantos, uh, not Cargill because it's a privately held company, uh, or Syngenta, the majority of shares now are owned by these institutional investors. And they needed to change the shares on the deck of the Titanic because Monsanto had got a very bad name. And they thought that by shifting the name to buy and shifting to aspirin, everyone would say, wow, now a healer is going to look after us. By the way, Bayer is an inventor of heroin. It had the first patent on heroin. And the reason it was called heroin was because you, it made you feel like a hero. So that's the basic reason. They, you know, they thought they'd start scratch and, from scratch and continue this huge new empire and they didn't realize that things would catch up so fast. BlackRock has lost 30% in October last year. Vanguard has lost. Because on, on speculation and false promises, how much can you make a food economy rest? I think we have time for one or two more questions. Namaste. Thank you very much for your talk and a great release of the book. And the topic's very dear to me. And while I was listening to your talk and Vandana's speech, I understood that there is a brighter side of this where there are sustainable practices that are being implemented by various different uh, areas, including in Africa and in India, and your university that you've started, which is sort of a think tank for the new way of living. How much of the erstwhile knowledge we've had from civilizations past say probably Indian civilizations, which has had about 12,000 years of sustainable agricultural practices, and say the First Nations like she mentioned, are we actually bringing back to actually have a farming systems that are of the tomorrow that will feed us, uh, that can actually counter this dark clouds of the corporate greed, so to speak. For example, uh, the, the case of the cow or the case of erstwhile seed pr protection from the farmers in India, uh, the, there are certain cow breeds that have been eliminated and probably Vandana knows this better than I do. The boss indicus cow and its dung for fertilizing that, that relationship is completely sort of eliminated in some places. And the seeds from like thousands of years of the farmers that they actually keep in their traditional families have sort of like gone away from this monoculture distribution. Sort of maybe you could speak about how Africa and the different parts of the world are actually now using the older erstwhile knowledge systems in farming and keeping sustainable seeds and practices active. That will help us for the tomorrows that we're talking about. No, that, I think that's a really good point and um, a hard one to answer quickly because I know we're running out of time, but I'm going to give my very short answer to it. Um, it deserves a lot more attention. It gets a lot of attention in my book. Um, I mean, take Mexico. There are a lot of very, Mexico has been the laboratory for the Green Revolution. It's where wheat, the variety of wheat that Norman Borlaug um, developed was, was first um, developed. Um, hybrid maize and um, high yield maize was, was developed there. The National Wheat and Maize Improvement Center of the International System is there. They have a whole National Research Institute that for years and years was dedicated to developing these modern seeds. And yet, 
today, less than 30% of the corn grown in that country is grown using those commercial seeds. 70% of the corn is grown using native seeds. Why? Because they're better. Because farmers know they're better. They taste better. They're more nutritious. They grow better in the, in the varying conditions that farmers have in their fields. They're not grown, they're growing those commercial seeds on the big, huge plots of land in Sinaloa. But in the hillsides of Oaxaca, they're growing those, their native maize because it works. And so, in a way, the most, uh, I, I've said to many people that I have a kind of perverse optimism or a, uh, an optimist, a pessimistic optimism, which is that the optimism comes from the fact that what we're doing is such a disaster and what we're promoting is such a failure and failing on its own terms in a lot of ways. It's not like the Green Revolution in Africa is creating a huge productivity boom in Africa. It's not. And so it's failing on its own terms and alternatives are asserting themselves. Yeah, just quickly. Um, you know, both farming and eating uh, can't be invented. They're part of cultural and biological evolution of millennia. And what's called organic farming today is named after the fact that the British sent in 1905 Albert Howard to India to improve Indian agriculture. We're always being improved. Our seeds are being improved. We are being improved. And uh, he arrived and found the soils were fertile and there were no pests in the field. He said, I'm going to make the Indian peasant and the pest my professor. He studied by observing what Indian farmers do. He wrote a book called the Agricultural Testament. It's called the Bible of Modern Organic Farming. Rodale published it here because Rodale came to visit Harvard in India. Eve Balfour published it in, U in UK. It became the Soil Association. So the contemporary organic movement, which is growing at 25%, is actually rooted in those ancient traditions. Now, this, you know, the Eating Tomorrow by Tim is one, and Eating Tomorrow by Eat and Fresh is the other. They want a global planetary diet of fake meat, fake milk, heavily processed food, Lots of fertilizers. And they talk about inventing food as if we didn't know how to eat. So, and my battle with Monsanto for 31 years has been, no, Mr. Monsanto, GMOs don't mean God move over. You are not the inventor of seed. Seed invents itself on a daily basis through tremendous evolutionary processes. And that creation, joined with the co-creation by farmers, is the brilliance of the breeding of the corn. And in, in Madhya Pradesh, where you were visiting in Shivpuri, you know, we grow traditional wheat varieties, 9% protein compared to the 2 or 3% in the chemically bred. And interestingly, Monsanto tried to patent our old wheats, which survive in Madhya Pradesh, because they don't contribute to gluten allergies. And we have them strike down that patent. I've given this the name biopiracy, stealing the knowledge of indigenous cultures. There's so much to be stolen because there's so much diversity out there, so much knowledge out there. And that's why knowledge sovereignty is such an important part, along with seed and food sovereignty. Fabulous. Thank you both. Thank you all for coming. We'll be outside signing books for a little while. and. Um, yeah, this is going to be online too, right? We've taped this, so you can all watch yourself again. Thank you.